Mass Tort News presents LegalCast. Welcome to the front line of breaking news in mass torts and other complex litigation areas. We bring you real-time intel and opinions about litigation dockets that are changing history. Sarah Papantonio gives updates on NEC litigation, including initial discovery, defense strategy, and insights on bellwether selections. Hi, Sarah. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? Well, thank you so much for joining us. So I uh, wanted to talk today about uh, the NEC MDL and was hoping that you could give um, a little bit of a recap and let us know what's going on. What's the update? Absolutely. We are full steam ahead in the NEC litigation. And and the great aspect of this case, great part of this case, is that the defendants, Abbott and Mead Johnson, are feeling pressure from virtually every angle. You have the federal litigation, which is what I'm a part of. You have the state court litigation, which has been moving for the last year. And you also have an additional litigation. So you, so what came out in this last year is litigation against Abbott for um, a Similac recall. We all saw it in the news. You know, they had to shut down all of their plants essentially because their manufacturing processes were devastating. So you have bad publicity against these companies. You have litigation against these companies. And you've got great trial lawyers fighting for these parents and children who have suffered tremendously at the hands of these companies. So it is all very exciting. In terms of the federal um, litigation, what we have right now, we are moving into the discovery phase. That is my favorite part about litigation. We get to ah, look don't in- tell everyone that. <laughs> <laughs> we get to look into Abbott and Mead's file cabinets, figure out what they know, when they knew it, and how long they have known it for. And so that is, that is it's all very exciting. It's all very new, but we have a very, very advanced timeline here. Wow. And and just curious, because I, I might also admit that I like the discovery phase too. Uh, are you currently arguing about, uh, you know, time time period or the scope of discovery? Is, is that what's happening right now? So, you know, we always say we've got an advanced timeline for discovery and then these all these fights come up. We are in the midst of some big discovery battles. And that has a lot to do with some of these companies preservation guidelines and protocols. And so we're not seeing what we think we should be seeing in the discovery and in the production. So we are taking those up with the defense and and we're hopefully going to get in a place in the next couple of weeks where we have a full and comprehensive scope of discovery. And that discovery here is extensive, you know, because our position is that they were on notice and had knowledge of the increased risk of NEC when exposed to formula uh, as far back as the 1990s. So, I mean, we're talking 30 years of documents and, and that is a fight with companies like this. Also, a lot of paper cuts because in the 90s, we didn't have electronic discovery, right? Yeah, but that's when the best documents uh, come because the, the the defendants start to learn in the 2000s and 2010s that they, they can't put things in writing. So that's why we want to go far as far sure. back as the 1990s as we can. Well, uh, it sounds, you know, frustratingly exciting. Um, and hopefully you're able to uncover what you need to build to build up your case. But it, it sounds like uh, you've got, you know, the whole team has a lot of, uh, you know, preparation and, uh, you know, is, is certainly ready to get their hands dirty, um, you know, and dig into whatever you've got. Um, what else, uh, what other battles or obstacles are, are you running into or disputes rather? So I, I would say our biggest battle right now is just the the time frame. We are excited that we have a judge who wants to move these cases so quickly. I mean, that our primary goal here is to recover for these parents and these children as quickly as we can. Uh, time is of the essence, and, and it is moving fast. So we have to develop this case as quickly as we can. Right now, the close of our fact discovery is in April, and then expert reports will be due somewhere in June or July, and then we will be going to trial trial in the first quarter of 2024. To yeah, the, this is to quick. The, this yeah, is really quick. <laughs> to the layperson, that seems like a long time. But when you are looking at millions of pages of documents, it goes by fast. And so we are doing everything we can right now to make sure we stay organized, stay on track and build up these bellwether cases in a way that we can be successful. Wow. I mean, that's quite a task to organize. I mean, the sheer volume of documents that you know you'll have before you, but also organizing 
you know, all of the different attorneys involved and, and parties. And, and yeah, that, that does seem like a long time, I suppose, when you're in the thick of it as a plaintiff, um, you know, or a defendant, but more so a plaintiff. But, but really in, in lawyer years, that's, uh, that's a blink of an eye. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, I would say the second biggest battle is who we're up against as well. You know, we have yeah. Great attorneys on the other side, but these are the attorneys who represented Big Tobacco. They're the attorneys who represented the opioid companies. They are the attorneys who, you know, have been appointed by President Trump. They are, you know, <laughs> they are the worst of the worst is what I would call them. Um, but so we we really, really have big battles ahead of us. But we are like we prevailed in Big Tobacco, like we prevailed in opioids. We will mm -hmm. prevail here against these guys. And, you know, it's one thing to have, you know, defense firms on the other side. I've always believed, and, and one of my mentors when I was a very, very junior attorney had said to me, you know, you're, you're, and I never understood it, right? When I first started, it's better to have a really good, really good counsel, or at least knowledgeable, skilled counsel on the other side, rather than someone who has no idea what they're doing. So, so clearly these attorneys know the, the game, they know the system, they know how they litigate. Tell me what you're up against, what, what you're dealing with, and, and what makes it difficult um, in this particular uh, MDL. I, I mean, you're exactly right. They know the system, they know the game, and they know how to game the system. And um, so a nice light read, which I would recommend everyone watching this should read, is a book called uh, Servants for the Damned. It was written by David Enrich. And this is a book that focuses on Jones Day, who is the defense, the, the defense counsel that we're up against. And it is appalling. I mean, it will make you just red reading it. Essentially what it says is, is that this defense firm has a decades long history of, of cheating the system, right? Of gaming the system. These are the people, like I said, who, who are you big tobacco cases? They are the people who are you opioid cases. They are the, the, the Trump appointees. They are the people who are dictating politics, right? They are fully ingratiated in, in every aspect of society. And that's who we are fighting against. And so it's kind of a, it, it's really eye-opening to see what goes on in these defense firms. I mean, we know what we see it, but for people in the public who are not used to coming to the table and fighting like this each and every day, it's a lot to fathom. And so, you know, we're ready for it. We're excited for it, but it, it is an uphill battle. And what, I mean, I, you know, it's not a secret. I, I used to be in, in defense, although not at Jones Day, um, at, at defense firms. And certainly they work differently than plaintiff's firms. What, what specifically um, are you talking about or, or what sort of, I hate to use the word tactics, but what sort of um, strategies are you combating right now that are you know proving to be, again, not a challenge, but let's say interesting. So, I, and you know, I, I hate to offend. I know you came from big law and now you are on the bright side of things. You're not so going to offend me. You here. Right. Over here. <laughs> but you know, these are the type of people who at the end of the day, when they come home from, from working on this NEC case, and if they can say, Hey, look, I prevented a mother who lost her child, or I prevented a child who has debilitating life injuries from recovering in this case, they call that a good day. That is what they will celebrate at the end of the day. And that speaks wonders to the type of lawyers who are trying these cases. You know, their ultimate goal in Big Tobacco was to prevent thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people from recovering for the, you know, the life-threatening cancers and life-threatening illnesses they got. Their goal was to keep addictive opioids on the market for as long as possible and get more people addicted. And oh, by the way, let's just change the whole public narrative so people don't know how addictive the, and how dangerous these products are. You know, it's the, it's the mindset that we are against. It is this idea that we are trying to do whatever we can to prevent the people who have been terribly injured by a product from recovering in this case. And I would say that's the biggest battle. I mean, I, I, the people across the table from us are absolutely brilliant. They're absolutely brilliant, but they are, they are cheeky and they are slimy. And I, and I think that, uh, like I said, this book, Servants for the Damned, is a great uh, look into that. And so you know, I, I hear what you're saying and I completely, um, you know, I don't want to say I agree um, and I don't want to say I disagree. Um, there certainly are attorneys that 
might think that. Um, I don't believe that every attorney goes home and says it's a good day because of that specifically, um, in part because as junior attorneys, at least, right? And that's not who you're dealing with. But junior attorneys may not even know what the larger picture is because they're, you know, siphoned that type of work. But um, let's just, just, you know, slide that aside for for a minute. Um, are the are the parties at least coming together and working towards some sort of bigger goal? You know, clearly the defense doesn't want this to proceed to trial so quickly, right? They're obviously trying to drag their feet and and lengthen that time. They don't want you to see all of the documents that they may have, right? You know, there's there's those sorts of strategies. But um, you know, what about the collaboration? And uh, you know, has Judge Palmeyer said anything uh, about that? Um, you know, I, I I know that judges love when attorneys go out in the hallway and come to a, a you know an agreed. Uh, you know, path forward. It, is any of that happening here or is it really, um, really adversarial already? No, you know, we've got a clear path forward. You know, we have, a, a, I would say, a good relationship with the defense and, and we will give and take where it needs give and taking. Uh, that being said, we are the beginning of the discovery phase. So this is when things start getting pretty adversarial uh, and, and we're starting to see that. And in uh, four months from now, when we, we hit that dis- discovery endpoint, I might have a different answer to that. But for the most part, both parties do want to move this case. I think they want to move this case for different reasons, but they do. You know, you've got Abbott and Mead who are just really at the very bottom in terms of a public opinion of them right now. Generally speaking, infant formula companies can ride on public opinion, right? Because they are feeding the babies. They are providing nutrients to families. They they get to flash the ushy gushy commercials that say, you know, this is my beautiful child and, and look how he's fed. But in reality, if you take a deep dive into these formula companies kind of background, I would compare them to a big tobacco, to a, uh, a an opioid company in terms of their marketing tactics, in terms of their advertising. I mean, the, the formula companies, like we said, get to hide behind those, those great commercials and and great PR. But in reality, they are doing all the same things that we saw some of the nastiest companies in in society do. They are working on an addiction model where they get mothers and children addicted to a formula that we are finding is ultimately dangerous, incredibly dangerous to that subclass of, of infants, which is premature infants. So I think, I think they are really trying to, to, to navigate the, public perception of these companies and preserve their image. Because like I said, you've got three major litigations, state court, federal court, and this Similac recall going against them all at once. And that is not a good place to be. No, it's certainly incredibly difficult. Um, And I I think more so as the internet has become a part of, you know, the the, uh, legal world, right? Attorneys' lives we see how PR and marketing and advertising and all of that really comes into play. Um, Like you had said in in different words, right? Companies, um, there's a narrative that's out there about companies, whether or not they choose to participate. And so these companies essentially are, manufacturers are forced to participate. Um, You say it's an addiction model, which, you know, is, is incredibly interesting. How though, you know, if you're on the defense side, which I realize you're not, you know, how do you, go up against the sheer fact, right, that this formula was fed to babies um, and there are catastrophic injuries, fatalities that are that are happening. How do you navigate that? What's the narrative there? You know, the same way they navigated uh, the R.J. Reynolds tobacco cases, the same way they navigate the opioid cases is, is it's a lot of victim blaming. Honestly, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see these companies blame the mothers and blame the families and, and blame anyone but themselves. When 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 we look yeah. into their file cabinets, we will see that they're equally, if not more, if greatly more to blame than than any mother or any doctor. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm not completely heartless. Um, I, I'm a mother, right? I've got I've got children, and I, I got to tell you, especially if your child's premature and and maybe your first child or or you know even the not first child, you're not in the right mindset to even do anything other than try your best, right? Kids don't pop out with instruction manuals, right. and a lot of times, you know, these mothers are are doing what they believe is best. Sometimes the children can only take one formula, um, you know, for one reason or another. But 
uh, I, I just, I don't, I don't know how you face that. I think that's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, I never worked on, on these products liability cases when I was in defense, but, um, you know, it, it's, I don't know how one does that. So, um, you know, the story that you all get to paint, and it's not really a story, it's, it's just telling the story of these mothers and these families. Um, talk to me, if you can, just for a moment about uh, the Bellwether cases. Uh, are there, I think, 12? Did I did I look and see that there were 12? Yeah, that's correct. So we have 12 Bellwether selections. We had four plaintiff picks, four defense picks, four random picks. And the look of them is really great. We, you know, we love the look of these Bellwethers. What we will do uh, once the close of discovery hits is we will narrow down those 12 to four that we will ultimately set trials for. It'll be two plaintiff's picks and two defense picks. And kind of like you said, the facts are with us. I mean, we, we don't even have to put on a story. We merely just have to prevent the devastating facts of a mother losing her child or the the just horrifying nature that one of our bellwethers has to live in. You know, they're completely immobile. And, and that speaks for itself. So it is our job then to take that story and tie the liability to it. And, and, and we really think we're going to be able to do that. Um, so the, what we're looking at is a trial date of early 2024. And when we start seeing verdicts come out of these cases, I don't know how they continue to defend any of these. It, it's it's difficult, like you said. You know, you just you you just have to sort of stand there. Um, and you know, again, it's not about um, you know an expose or, or using the plaintiffs in any way other than to tell the story. But the truth is, I think a parent losing their child is the 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 worst possible thing that could happen. You know, it, it's horrible to lose a family member, a parent, uh, a grandparent. But that's how life works. You're not supposed to lose your children. Yeah. Um, and, and, especially yeah. something like this to, to, to something that, that stemmed from baby formula. Uh, okay. I just. And something that, that what we can see now from the science was entirely preventable. I think that's, I, I think that's the hardest part to bear is, is this was entirely preventable. Can you speak on that a little bit? You know, everyone always talks about the science, but what, what does the science say right now? So what we know um, and what, what these companies should have known for decades is that there's an increased risk associated with NEC with premature infants who are fed a cow's milk formula. So, so it's kind of, it's important to put it in subsets. We are not saying all formula is dangerous. We are saying premature infants cannot properly digest cow's milk formulas, so bovine-based formulas. And as a result, they are at an increased risk of developing NEC. And it's like a, it's anywhere between five to 10 times increased risk. It's significant. And so in the early 2000s, you had companies recognize this, that we have a, an infant population, the most vulnerable infant population of premature infants who cannot digest this food. So what do we do? We make a safer design for them. And, and what that is, is a human milk-based formula. And so there is there has been safer alternatives out there for the last two decades, essentially. And, and all it is, is replacing the bovine milk with the human milk. But of course, you know, when we're talking about corporations, and, and I am jaded, I apologize uh, just from working in this industry, the, de the decision is not okay, what is safer? It is what is more cost effective. And of course, you're going to see the defense come out with the arguments that, that human milk only formulas are, are not cost effective. But if you take a, you know, our, our response to that is if you take a look at it in, in the grand scheme of thing, things is, is children who are diagnosed with neck have hundreds of thousands of, of medical bills that they have to pay. So in the grand scheme, it is actually a safer and cheaper alternative than, than being diagnosed with neck. Right. And what's that just because I have no idea and formula is crazy expensive as it is. What, what is the human milk and forget how it's made, but what is the human formula um, price comparison uh, when you look at human versus bovine? I actually can't give you the exact number right now. It, it's probably a few times higher than a formula yeah. based, but, it, but here's kind of where the shift happens. It's not like the, the mothers are, are paying this out of pocket in the NICU. 
there's actually a marketing scheme and strategy that's set up by these formula companies where they give hospitals formula for free. And that mm-hmm. kind of ties into that addiction model that I was talking about. So they give NICU nurses and, and doctors free formula so that they can create brown, brand loyalty in the NICU. So that when the mother finally is able to, to take that child out of the NICU, they say, oh, well, he was fed Similac. So I'm not going to change his feeding pattern after that traumatic right. event. And it creates right. brand loyalty for the first child, the second child, the third child. And that's really why they start with that free product in the hospital hospitals because they want to create that model down the road. So in speaking of cost, it, it's, it's, you can't really compare it because of that kind of scheme sure. that these guys have in place. It makes sense. And, you know, we see that with, you know, hospitals, doctor's offices, I'm thinking of, you know, being sent home with a, a particular kind of diaper, you know, that sort of thing. And, and it makes sense if it, if it works, then, you know, let's continue to use it. Um, but, but certainly a lot uh, that will come out when all of the documentation is, um, you know, is shared and, and you're able to rifle through it. Yeah. And um, listen, just to put that into perspective, sorry, no, this idea of, of free formula being given to hospitals is totally isolated to the United States. So in the, in the 1980s, you had, um, uh, the, the World Health Organization come out and say, we've got this major problem. We see that the formula companies are creating addiction models. So what we're going to do to stop that is we're going to create a worldwide code that polices and regulates the formula companies. But in order to follow that code, your country has to buy into it, right? They have to vote to agree that we're going to follow this breastfeeding code. As part of that that code, what it says is if you are a formula company, you cannot advertise your product, cannot advertise. You cannot give free samples. So out of all the countries in the world, guess who was the one who did not vote to follow that code? The United States, right? Because that is their entire business model. And I feel like that story, that narrative just speaks to what what the bones of this case look like. It, It is really just a story of greed and power and control here. It's interesting. And um, I'm not surprised to hear that uh, after working so much on this idea of lactation rooms in court houses and the like. And if you look at maternity leave uh, and other countries, I think there's a, a John Oliver episode where he says that the U.S. is all the way at the bottom of the list um, and that Papua New Guinea is right above us. I mean, it's just like it's complete nonsense. So, um, you know, there perhaps is greater reform on the horizon, but you've got to step back and say, did this have to happen in order for that to occur? I mean, can't we live in a world where ethics rule and and people, you know, come together even at the formula companies and realize that there's there's an ethical code and, and this doesn't quite fit it. Mm-hmm. You know, that, yeah, that's exactly um, maybe right. utopian, but um proactive instead of reactive. Once sure. once we, the plaintiff lawyers, the mass tort lawyers, can convince uh convince defense firms and, and corporate firms about that, we will be out of business and that'll be a good thing for all of us. Yeah. Well, I, unfortunately, there'll probably be something else for you to work on, or yeah. unfortunately and fortunately. But yeah, I mean, it, it's really, you know, between that and then the recalls of, of various formulas, the shelves are still somewhat empty um, when I go shopping. Mm-hmm. And I just, every time I walk by, I just think about these cases and the parents that are struggling so hard uh, it's, it's really unfortunate. Um, but, um, we're really grateful to be able to talk to you and, and get uh, sort of inside your head a little bit. Um, no need to ever apologize. This is how it works. And frankly, it's, it's really good to be able to have a discussion about it. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, that everything will come to light. Um, I'd love to talk to you again when you've got a little bit more um, information, perhaps when you've whittled down the bellwethers and, and are um, further along in discovery, because I'm dying to know what you find. Uh, Absolutely. It's just uh, the companies are too large. And um, when your paper's involved, it's a whole nother ball game. But um, I do not envy the paper cuts. I, I don't miss those at all. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much for joining us um, on Master News, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Have a good one.